Okay. Um, I think now you should be able to do screen share. If you could try. Should I go first? I, don't, I can try. Uh, yeah, it's working. Perfect. Is it working? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thanks. I'll just stop it then. Okay, I can try. Okay, so. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I somehow have to. You have to go to Ansicht. No, but uh, okay. So you you don't see it in full screen, right? No. And now you do? Yes. Okay. So this works. I see some strange green line, but that's fine. Yeah, that's something I actually don't understand. Where this comes from. Okay, I can. Okay, now it's gone. Okay. And like the students will answer questions by video or audio or by, by using the chat. What is your? Uh, okay, so uh, we, in addition to Zoom, um, we're also streaming to Facebook and YouTube. And from those, so I'll be uh, I'll pay attention to the the comment sections um, on on those uh, streams. Um, and I'll just ask you those those questions myself. Uh, okay. Um, and we also have, um, uh, may have people joining here on Zoom throughout the session. Uh, and if those people uh, want to ask the questions, I can give them permission to um, like, so they can connect through audio uh, or even video uh, if they wish to. Yeah, my experience is that it's uh, and they can ask you the questions let, themselves. My experience is that it's sometimes easier to let them write down their questions because it avoids all these sorts of technical audio etc problems, which can sometimes be a bit annoying if there's a tense person that you cannot hear or so. Yeah, yeah, true. Is it, is it a YouTube live stream? So is there, do you have a link? Uh, yeah, I'll I'll begin it shortly. I think. Ah, okay. That's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, no, that's fine. Okay, we're. Okay. I think we should be starting on YouTube now. Okay. Yeah. So now we're live on YouTube here. I'll just start it on Facebook as well and we can begin. Um, okay. Okay, and we are starting. Now. Okay, uh, so welcome to this um, fourth session 
of the third week um, of IAP set a distance. Um, as you know, today's topic is uh, physics of socioeconomic systems. We've already had uh, sort of a first session uh, on this topic with um, Dr. Magda Schiegel. Uh, and today we have uh, a second session on the topic with Dr. Mark Thieme um, of the, the Physics of Socioeconomic Systems Divisions of the, the DPG, the German Physical Society, uh, and Dr. Oliver Richters. Now I will just um, uh, welcome our speakers and um, just read um, their, their bios to introduce them and then give them the word for their um, presentations on the topic. So um, Mark Thieme uh, studied physics and mathematics in Wurzburg. After work as a postdoctoral researcher uh, at uh, the Max Planck Institute for Flow Research and as a research scholar at University USA, he was selected to head a broad, um, broadly cross-disciplinary Max Planck Research Group on Network Dynamics at the Max Planck Institute for Dynamics and Self-Organization. Uh, Mark held a visiting professorship at TU Darmstadt and was visiting faculty at ETH Zurich. He is now a strategic professor and has the chair for network dynamics at the Cluster of Excellence uh, uh, Center for Advancing Electronics Dresden and the Institute for Theoretical Physics at TU Dresden. He is also co-chair of the Division of Socioeconomic Physics of the German Physical Society and since 2018 honorary Clackenford with co-dynamics of complex systems and their applications in fields of energy and sustainability, mobility, as well as biological and bio-inspired information processing. Welcome, welcome uh, Mark. Uh, and we also have uh, Dr. Oliver Richters, uh, born in 1986. He has a bachelor's in physics at Technical University Darmstadt for, uh, in 2010. Uh, master's in Physics at Karl von uh, Ossietzky University Oldenburg from 2015, and a doctorate in Economics at Karl von Oldenburg in uh, uh, this year, precisely. Uh, worked on trust propagation on networks, dynamic economic models, and the connection between economic growth, economic stability, justice, and environmental degradation. Um, he is author of uh, Repairing the Market Economy um, and Society. Uh, so now I will give the word to um, Mark so we can begin his presentation. Thank you very much for your presence. Thank you, Duarte. Thank you, everyone, for having us uh, today. Thank you, Duarte. I hope uh, my audio is stable you you daughter we we heard you a bit like uh, stephen hawking uh, who said that this century yeah. is a century of complexity which gives us a good entry into the topic i'll start uh, sharing my screen yeah yeah, so thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'll repeat a few of the items relevant and I'll, I'll try to sketch briefly both what is physics of socioeconomic systems from my and our perspective. And also um, I, I highlight a few items of our own research with a particular focus on mobility systems. Um, the work I'll show is, is all with Malte Schröder, who is a senior scientist in our, our chair, and uh, several PhD and master's students and postdocs, actually. Yeah, as, as you mentioned, uh, Duarte, I have several affiliations, but my main one is uh, the chair for network dynamics at the Institute for Theoretic Physics and the Center for Advancing Electronics, Dresden, which is somewhere between um, teaching and very abstract and research and very applied. Um, I'm also co-chair of the 
Physics of Social Economic Systems Division of the German Physical Society, Deutsche Physikalische Gesellschaft. And that is the oldest and also the largest physics association on our only planet. Uh, we have in total more than 60,000 members and the uh, SOE is has been founded in 2001 by Dirk Helbing and others. And uh, so this means that early next year we'll have hopefully our online or offline celebration of the 20th anniversary, uh, anniversary of the division, which became a division actually only in 2009. So it's a typical uh, birth, childhood and adulthood um, history of the division. And um, main question today is why why is there any physics of socioeconomic systems? And I think both Oliver and I will a bit uh, let the world know our view of what we think about this question. Um, we are facing in the 21st century um, a large number of very, very gigantic actually societal challenges and these translate into scientific challenges. And as you know, we are in multiple crises or have been in multiple crises uh, in part simultaneously. And one is climate crisis, of course, it's in everyone's mind today, but also there's a resource crisis, not only water and some rare earth metals, but very many resources are um, lacking sustainability in the sense that, for example, soil is used up at an incredible rate and if we continue like that, it will be gone by the end of the century. There are completely no available soil lying around. Um, then there's obviously several have been, and there are several energy crises. There has been a recent, uh, not so recent, but 2008 global and some more local financial crises and resulting economic crisis. Uh, also the current uh, corona, crisis is linked to economical factors. Then there's this refugee crisis where I put crisis in parentheses because it's actually a crisis from my point of view, that's my opinion, but it's actually a crisis of course for the people who have to leave their home and they have to leave their country and, and their friends and everyone. Um, but uh, we in the Western world are more and more viewing this as a crisis for us, which actually is minimal compared to what the people who actually leave their homes uh, experience. Then of course there's Corona crisis, which is only I think one example of a global pandem pandemic, which will also caused due to climate change, um, more, li more likely than not experience more than once in this century. And there are several environmental crises and you can come up with more of your own favorite crisis. And essentially all of these are present more or less today or in this decade, the past decade simultaneously. So there are many things to understand, to predict and to control. And uh, in addition to that, the world is changing from um, the developmental point of view. There are many factors which change our daily lives. Uh, one you are seeing right now by viewing this talk over an online channel, which wasn't possible in this uh, professional form 10 years ago. It's increasing technology usage, but not only the internet, but really everywhere. It's in buildings and how you transport people and goods. And it's also in pervasive, more and more pervasive artificial intelligence. It is uh, by increasing global um, dependencies. I'm looking for mouse, do I have a mouse? Ah, yeah. Sure. Ah, very nice. Um, I'm, yeah, there's, there are increasing population as a human population, but that the size in itself is not a problem, but the heterogeneity is a problem where people are crowding up and where is the, where are the resources and where are the people needing those resources? 
one particular problem is urbanization, but of course there are others like hunger. Um, there's increasing inequalities, and I hope uh, Oliver will talk about that and how to try to cure that. And there's loss of social cohesion, as you see, we see in Germany uh, by small, relatively small symptoms, like some parties split up and uh, other groups form and people don't believe what scientists say and so on. So all of that um, pushes us to understand global and unprecedented complex problems. Um, but why are these physics problems? The um, one answer we, we drive from the physics perfect perspective is to actually understand first principles, uh, mechanisms of typically collective features. So we have a system and you want to understand the entire system and, and mechanisms uh, underlying how these systems behave by disentangling the essential parts, not by making a case study about one particular item. So you don't, physicists are typically not interested in understanding the thousands and thousands of details of a city. Rather, they are interested in general principles guiding, for example, the growth of cities or the energy consumption of cities. Um, also, in distinction from, for example, engineering or other related subjects, physicists typically don't control systems just like that, but they, they even if you have a controlled system or you want to control a system, the first level analysis is always to understand what's going on. If you don't have even control, you just take the system without control. Then you try to predict it and then you try to control it or guide the system into states which you like, which like them to be. And then there are of course phenomena known from physical system. I'll, I'll go into more details on the next slide. And of course, the big toolbox and methods box coming from physics. First and foremost, the, the approach, which I mentioned already of idealized modeling. So you want to isolate essential necessary features underlying a certain mechanism or a certain phenomenon. Then there are more general toolboxes like statistical physics, ensembles, for example, nonlinear dynamics, um, bifurcations, phase transitions, network dynamics, so complex topolo topologies of interactions, asymptotic and scaling analysis. And here, let me advertise a, a short piece which Martin and I wrote recently and will be coming up, I think, next month in Nature Physics about different ways of scaling analysis and how they, they can be very important in empowering you to analyze different types of phenomena in complex systems. Then, of course, there's mean field theory and there's stochastical approaches and perturbation theory and so on. I don't want to bore you with all the details because you learn them in, at university. But it's a physics toolbox which can help a lot in understanding certain general mechanisms under, underlying features you see of entire systems. Um, this is like another overview slide of what we do. And I think Duarte said that already. I don't know whether all of you heard that properly. Um, we, we are working on biological and bio-inspired problems, um, in particular on information routing and processing. The current subject focus is on inverse problems, for example, asking what kind of um, structures can result in what kind of dynamics, which also is related to the question of design. Can you design a system such that it exhibits an appropriate or desired collective dynamics? There are financial and social systems, in part optimization problems. And then a very large realm of our research is about uh, computing, as I said already, but also energy systems and mobility. And today I'll only talk about few aspects of our own mobility research, because I just want to keep it short. I spend the next five minutes um, talking about particular research projects. I don't even reveal all the mechanisms. I just say what the problems are. So in future mobility systems, there are lots of things at stake at the same time. 
there's of course if you consider street tra traffic for example standard car and and uh, truck traffic there's congestion problems massively there's uh, health and accidents we actually had a a child killed two days ago in Dresden by, by someone racing in a big street in the city, downtown. Um, there, there's time, waste, and well-being problems. There's environmental issues and energy waste. Actually, if you, if you think about it, how ineffective a privately owned car is, it is super incredible. So I'm very happy to talk to any of you later to, to explain why I think the car is one of the least effective things humankind ever invented. You can improve that by, by many, by a large factor, like by a factor of a hundred or something. And then there's infrastructure problems, more and more space in cities are becoming parking spaces, uh, in part because several people own more than one car. Uh, when I was a kid, the average, I think, was four people, like a family with two kids, had one car on average. And today, it's more, more like, okay, if you have two grown-up kids, like with two, two parents and two kids, if you count the number of cars, it's more like four. And in the US, it's worse. Um, when I was studying there in my master's, I was living in a household with three Germans, we were sharing a car because no car means no life. And um, all the other three people, they had four more cars. So we had five cars total. Um, there, are, there are economical aspects at stake in, in the mobility sector, both on the business side, like individual business may go bankrupt, even large ones. I don't mention names now, but uh, also entire countries and states may be affected by massive problems uh, of mobility. And here I mentioned in particular develop and, developing and transi transitory countries which don't have well-managed and well-regulated uh, mobility system. And more, many of these aspects get worse because both the population and in particular the population in cities grows like crazy and con will be continuing, continue to grow for the next couple of decades. Future mobility is said to be simultaneously more shared, more flexible, more ad hoc, more electric, more auton autonomous, more cost conscious, intermodal and seamless, interactive and thus networked. And it will operate at larger volume, higher density, large number of users, uh, large number of modes and so on. For example, also integrating rural and urban mobility. And somehow, if you add that up, it, the right hand side is is sold as like something like a solution to the left hand side, but it's not always true. And I will I will show you um, some hints of why that is not trivially true. Oops. Why is mobility a physics problem? Well, it's it's typically about collective dynamics. We are not interested in the individual pattern of single a single person or a single vehicle, but rather the collective of either many vehicles or many modes of vehicles. You go by bike to the train station and once you arrive at your train destination, you go by whatever bus and you want to go to for work. It's complicated because it has to fit in time and in space and you have to fit with other people. So there's a collective dynamics going on and this is part of what our research is on about. Then of course, the same as in general, we have to first understand to predict and to understand, to control these systems. And many phenomena actually we have found already in, until today in a couple of years research, uh, which stem from deep statistical physics and even condensed metaphysics. Um, but we found them in mobility systems, including hysteresis, universality, scaling laws, and frustration. The first example I'll sketch is the hysteresis we talk about um, taxi, my mouse is gone again. Good, good. Um, we talk about taxi requests in Manhattan. This is a sketch of Manhattan. Red means high number of requests, large number of requests per minute. And the 
um, the gray curve here is over the course of a few days, the number, the request rate, so the number of requests per minute in a, in a part of, in this part of Manhattan. And it's um, increasing and decreasing, of course, at night it's low, at day it's high, and sometimes it's, it's going particularly high, like here. And at the same time, the blue curve shows the number of available taxis. And at night, it's of course high. And, but at this moment, when um, the number of the request rate is particularly high, this is not going down a bit, but it's actually going down to zero. So the number of available taxis drops to zero. There's no taxi value. You call a taxi, you want to call a taxi, and in the reply is there's no. Um, if you draw this, and this is a simulation based on real data, if you draw this in a state space of re request rate versus available taxis and not a function of time, but only mark the time here as, as dots, you see that there's certain stochasticity here, but then at some point, at some request rate, you drop to zero, and then you have to lower the request rate all the way to about half the original one when it dropped until taxis become available again. And this is actual real physical hysteresis as we know it from magnetism. And, and an open question here is how, how does it work? So just below the maximum load, if we are here, if we, know, if we didn't drop to zero, you can easily reduce the number of, of taxis. You would just uh, the, increase the number of taxis by reducing the request rate. So you reduce the request and you will just go back up here. But the moment you um, have crossed this maximum load, then making taxis available is extremely hard. And um, wait for the paper, but we are, we are currently writing this up. But this is a problem, how to understand why is this happening and, and what is the mechanism underlying this phenomenon. In particular, because this is waste. Like you, you have you here in this, state, you transport only half the people you could with the same number of taxis. So it's 50% waste. Yeah, I just said that substantial system cap capabilities are wasted and there's an inherent inefficiency in the system just due to hysteresis. How does it occur is the open question, which I don't answer because I don't have the time. There's a second example, which I go through more quickly. This is um, the pricing of Uber rides recorded at a Washington DCA airport over the course of a day. And you see it oscillates a bit. And in particular in the evening, although um, the um, number of arrivals, like how many passengers arrive approximately per minute, is roughly constant until late at night. The requests show these nice uh, fluctuations. So they have more or less constant jumps and, and no one knew where they came from. There were press reports and we were analyzing the data and, and uh, Malta and two students were, were doing a, constructing a mathematical game theoretic model of how these um, price surges can come about. And the obvious way is you ask whether it's related to arrivals. If there are lots of arrivals and many people want an Uber ride and there's not so many available, Uber has an automatic pricing, price adapting algorithm. So if there are, uh, there's more demand and less offers, it will go, go up. But the point is there was not more demand because there were not more arrivals. Actually, this is, these are two correlation uh, plots. Like you plot the third fee, like the actual, additional amount of money you pay compared to a base price. The base price varies because of distance driven and time driven, but that's not relevant here. So the, the real relevant is the search fee, the additional fee you pay because there's the, the demand doesn't match uh, supply. And even as the, so if you plot the correlation function here, even at the largest correlation points, these two, you see that the correlation is low. There's essentially no correlation. So this means it's not the demand for rights, it's the supply side. And actually the report, the newspaper report was about that drivers artificially shorten the supply because they just switched their app off 
once they all switch their app off, Uber, the Uber algorithm thinks that, oh, there's no uh, driver available. So let's increase the price because it attracts more drivers. And once you do that, you could, as a driver, then switch on your app again. Um, to be fair, that's, that's not fair for, from the driver's side, but also not fair from Uber's side because um, in total, more or less drivers are incentivized to do it in the first thing because it's the algorithm is made like that. And second, the, um, the total uh, pay per hour is not super large for a driver because they have to pay all the costs on themselves. themselves. Yeah, and the question here is, of course, how does it work? And we, as I said, we've set up a game theoretic model um, explaining mechanisms uh, driving those price searches. And the paper will be coming up very soon. It's recently accepted in Nature Communications. Um, second last example, uh, universality in ride sharing systems. Ride sharing means you share, you, so two people want to go say the orange and the red distance, and they could share on a common vehicle. Um, if they do, and if you successfully combine trips in at large scale, then you can, with a B number of vehicles, like cars or minibuses, you can transport many more people at the same time. And you can make that topology dependent, so depending on the street network and so on. You can, you can renormalize it first to have an effective load parameter. I don't go to details here. But then you can compute the number of um, the, the efficiency in terms of the number of, um, um, how do you say, the number of, well, either occupancy or what, what is here is, is uh, how, how this scales with the load. And what you see is if you accumulate, if you, sorry, if you rescale everything by this factor, then we find a common universal scaling function defining the, these efficiencies. So across different realms, like these are all artificial topologies and these are um, real topologies, like including Berlin and uh, Göttingen where I was before, but also small regions like uh, like non-urban regions like the Isle of Man, um, they all scale the same way. And we explained why this could be under certain conditions. And in particular, this yields an objective efficiency evaluation through the collective dynamics. So typically efficiency is gained, in term, is, is computed in terms of money or in terms of fuel consumption or something. And we have now an objective efficiency measure, which, um, is expressed in terms of the dynamics of the system, like how many people can I transport given a number of buses. A uh, very last slide uh, on our examples is uh, another question of how to systemically improve the bikeability of cities. This is um, also with Malta and with uh, a master students, Christoph who is um, Christoph Steinacker, who is investigating how to extend existing bike paths in a city so to, as to improve the, quality, the total quality of uh, the street net, the bike path network. For example, bicyclists don't like to go across big streets if there's no bike paths or a very uh, low level bike paths, like low quality bike paths. And if you have only finite resources, a city actually wants to know where to build it. And the typical way to build it with finite resources, for example, finite amount of money per year, if you want to extend it over the next 10 years, you could, could go ahead and always spend the, the first chunk of money in the next year you spend on those pieces of the street network where you get the, the largest gain initially, because you could think, okay, then in the long run, I have spent it early, so I get the largest. But that's in total, it turns out this is not a very good idea because you don't get the overall best um, bikeable network. Um, what we do is we, we take something like inverse percolation. We start assuming in a model, assuming that all bike paths are present and then remove some and remove them until your resource limit is uh, reached, roughly speaking. And it turns out that this is much more efficient than 
the doing it this more straightforward way. Yeah, with that, I, I thank you for your attention and also um, our group. If you have questions, um, I'm available by email. And of course, I'm available in the discussion after Oliver's talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Um, I want to, to apologize to anyone watching us uh, and to our speakers because I'm, uh, I had uh, a few technical issues uh, some, some minutes ago. Uh, so at the moment, um, because my internet connection was being overloaded uh, by the Facebook stream, um, for now we are streaming on YouTube. Uh, and I want to remind anyone watching us there uh, that they can still join us here on Zoom. It's a lot easier to um, ask questions to the speakers through here. Uh, if you go to the, the IAPS Facebook page, you have a post there uh, about this session with a link to register for Zoom. Um, so you can still join here. Um, Oliver for his presentation. Okay, Mark, uh, I think you have to uh, unshare your screen. <laughs> okay, there's some. Try again. Okay, I hope you can see everything and hear me. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So my the title of my talk is uh, "Life Among Economists" um, because I actually, as Duarte already said. I started uh, my studies as a physicist in Darmstadt. I worked on trust networks and then uh, did my master in physics. And there I already started to work on economic models. So uh, also my second supervisor was an economist and I worked on the integration of energy or energy, energy consumption um, into economic models. Um, and then I realized that my research interest is more into economics compared to uh, physics. So I was interested in first the fact that uh, economists had problems um, anticipating the financial crisis and explaining it with their models because they were essentially using models where no financial crisis was possible by definition. Um, and this relates to the question whether the equilibrium in a market, so which is the assumption that a market economy has a tendency to uh, convert to some sort of stable state um, so that the local interaction uh, actually results in some sort of global stability. Um, so how does this actually happen and how this can be modeled? And the third was more like the physics subject, environmental degradation, climate change, uh, biodiversity loss, and how this relates to um, our economic order or the economic system we're currently in. Um, as Mark already said, a bit was is that, and what I also saw at the uh, German Physical Society at the at the meeting of the Social Economic Systems Division, is that many people in econophysics, so physicists working with their methods and theories from physics, um, apply it to problems in economics, but seldomly actually interact with economists and with social sciences. Um, um, and so they somehow the physicists stand up and say, we've developed a new paradigm and um, the econ people actually are what? So they did, haven't really heard about it. They don't really um, realize that there is that there are new approaches um, to discussing economic problems. And um, a, a colleague of mine once summarized that if physicists meet economists, 
then arrogance meets ignorance. So this is a risk that I see um, if you just use your, um, your, your great math to work on, um, on another topic from the social sciences. So my recommendation or my choice uh, was essentially, if I want to work in the social sciences, um, work with social scientists. So don't um, only stay in your physics department, but um, look if you can find some economists, some sociologists, um, some other people to work with, as you probably can do if you join the group of Mark, for example. Um, so I decided to start a PhD in economics with part one, uh, the question of uh, discussing some ideas or some new ideas in economic modeling. And the second part is more about the social dilemma situation that I was um, interested in. So why, despite the fact that we see all this environmental degradation, biodiversity loss, etc., why we're still pushing economic growth, which is at least partly a part of the problem and part of the reason why um, we are um, have we are really destroying our ecosystems. Um, I want to give you some idea of economics because this is now the chance to do so. Um, economics, as I said, is mostly focused on some sort of equilibrium theory. And equilibrium is, um, for an economist, is a situation where demand equals supply. So this in the, in the right corner is the famous diagram that you will find in every economics textbook. It's a totem of economics, you could say, um, that the prices adapt such that the quantities that are produced and sold are actually the same as um, the same quantities that are demanded and bought by, uh, by consumers. And um, economic models have some basic assumptions that such an equilibrium exists. So the agents in their model usually are maximizers of some utility function. So they have a function. It's, uh, it measures their well-being, how happy they are with the choices they make. So how much they work, how much they consume. The firms are profit maximizers. So yeah, I mean, that's something you probably understand. And then they define um, these functions. So profit function and, and utility function such that you can actually find a unique and stable equilibrium where on each market, so on the labor market, on the money market, etc., cetera, um, all the individual decisions are compatible with each other. So the coordination problem is, as you could say, simply assumed away. It always works perfectly and the economy always reaches a, a stable state by definition. So the models are designed as such. And what Mark already said a, a bit is um, that um, there is the idea in economics that there is perpetual motion. So the, 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 the economic circuit um, is essentially a perpetual motion machine um, because they have a tendency to forget about the, the, um, the million, ton, million tons of, of uh, fossil fuels, of energy um, that are actually necessary to run this circuit. So to move all the things, to move the machines, to move cars, to, um, to actually produce something, you, as a physicist, you wouldn't be surprised that you need some sort of energy used to um, uh, make this run. So my question was, if those models usually simply assume that there is convergence to that there is that the equilibrium is stable and already reached, how can we model the convergence to towards equilibrium? And then also maybe not. So maybe there are some situations where this simply doesn't work and an equilibrium is simply not reached. A, sh a short reminder, because I will use some methods from physics too, even though I work together with economists, I adapted some concepts from physics, um, is a short reminder of Lagrangian mechanics that you've probably heard in the first or second year of your physics studies. And um, so you see these slot cars um, and um, there are different forces um, around. So there's the acceleration by the motor, it's uh, like the blue, arrow, then you have the constraint force. 
So Lagrangian mechanics is dynamics under constraint. So there is a force exerted by the track that keeps the car within the track. And uh, so the red arrow is the net force. So the actual acceleration of the car. And um, you may remember, if not, I'll tell you again, that this constraint force is always perpendicular to the constraint. So it doesn't accelerate or decelerate the, um, the car. So what does this have to do with economics? Um, this is quite interesting because in fact, in the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, um, economists were using concepts from physics to model their systems. So it's not only the econophysicists later in the, in the 20th century that started this, but this was essentially the, um, one of the basic ideas of um, economics when they started to model the economy. Um, and this is an example of a very simple economic model. Um, you see, it, so this describes you in a sense. So you can have money and you can have chocolate. And um, these uh, blue dotted curves show you um, the so-called indifference curves. So if you are, I, I hope that you can, that you can see this now. If you are along this curve, so if you have lots of money and not so much chocolate, or lots of chocolate and not so much money, you're indifferent about that. So the utility that you have from this you're, is identical. And of course, the more you have, the more you're happy. That's the basic economics assumption. And um, so the, you see these, these curves. So this is essentially a hill. Here you're unhappy and here you're really happy. Um, and you start somewhere here. So you have some money and some chocolate but you have to pay for chocolate. So if you want to have more chocolate, you need to spend money, which is obviously how market economies work. So you have this constraint you, you, can, you can choose on. So you can either have lots of chocolate or lots of money, or you can sit here exactly where the two um, lines meet. And this is for an economist, this is the optimal solution. So here you are as happy as you can get. And in the usual economic framework, you simply jump to this optimum and buy as much chocolate as you want, um, which is for a physicist. So if you just go back into thinking about forces that are there, um, it's a situation where the gradient of this utility function, so which is depicted by these curves, um, is just equal to the constraint force. So in equilibrium, this is the optimum in the equilibrium, this utility uh, gradient and the constraint force cancel out. And that's how they essentially adopted concepts from physics to economics. And my question was now, what happens if we do the dynamics? So if we don't do a static model, but actually do a dynamic model, where you start here and you have, you look at the dynamics until you reach this point. So this is how I transfer, um, transformed the concept of optimization under constraint to dynamics under constraint. So extend the analogies between physics and economics that are already there in the economic profession um, a bit further. Um, so mathematically, so to have um, um, the, the usual economic way is to maximize some function um, until the utility force, so which is this blue arrow, balances the constraint force, which is, which is perpendicular on this constraint. Whereas in my case, you, this essentially describes the dynamics of this uh, red arrow. And in the optimum, the red arrow vanishes. So the net force is zero. Okay, so this was essentially my idea how, how, I, how I contributed to making economics a true dynamic um, science in a sense, or to offer a, an economic modeling framework um, that can also incorporate situations where the system is not in equilibrium. Um, yeah, so the goal was to bring the Lagrangian mechanics um, to economics. And of course, my model in the end, I'm not going to detail here. If you want to read it, I can, uh, you can, you can, uh, of course, read the paper um, with this analogy. So in mechanics, you have the velocity of a, of a certain um, 
mass point. In economics, you have stocks, flows, and prices. So stock is money in your bank account. A flow is if you send money somewhere to somewhere else. You have in mechanics, you have constraints, constraint forces and, and forces. In economics, you have the same. I mean, they always talking about market forces. What I did was essentially formalize the concept of market forces, what they have, haven't done before. Um, and in economics, the, or in mechanics, you have mass, um, whereas in economics is economic power. Um, so you can see that the equations, in fact, are quite similar. Economic power is how much does um, a certain stock of flow react on a certain force. And in mechanics, it's essentially the same. If the mass is high, then the reaction of the velocity to a certain force of a of a particle is um, uh, is small. So this is the analogy um, that I draw on. Um, and in fact, if you have this framework, you can have you have the constraints, you have this time evolution. So the forces, market forces, or social forces, or whatever you want to have um, that describe some sort of interaction between individuals. And you have these constraint forces that guarantee that the system remains, uh, remains consistent. Um, so for a physicist, I think if you try to get some intuition, and if you maybe have some idea of how economic models um, are designed, it's, I think it's quite easy to understand. Uh, still, it's understandable even for economists. And this was something that I considered quite uh, important. Um, the whole model is then a bit more complex with various sectors and households, etc. Um, but again, I incorporate many assumptions that are familiar, that I used in uh, in economic models to make it understandable also to economists. Um, one of the results that I think were interesting is that I could show that in the green part of the parameter space, so I did some stability analysis there. The mass capacities of most physics students are very helpful if you work in, in economics. That the system is stable here in this part for a certain range of parameter um, values, but it's also unstable in others. So simply assuming that it's always stable, I think, is a is a big flaw in, in economic models because it depends on conditions, on parameters, and adaption speeds, etc. Okay. Um, this um, this framework, as I said, is inspired by physics, but it's still based on economic models. So this is how I try to bring together these two worlds. But of course, I mean, the reaction uh, is the physicist coming, hey, I have a new framework, and economists still say, what? Um, so what do we want with this? Um, or at least this is, a, um, um, this is um, maybe a normal reaction um, if you come with something new. Um, and we'll see whether it will actually turn out to be uh, to be of interest to, to economists. The second question I will touch on just a bit shortly is um, the question of exponential growth. Because it was always quite surprising to me that the usual answer or the usual reaction to, economic, to exponential growth by economists is that it's their goal. And in physics, you often have the situation that you say, well, exponential growth destroys every system. So if you have a, a limited system and something is growing exponentially, you consider the solution of the differential equation as being unphysical and just drop it, which is essentially op opposite of what um, economists do. Um, and this was a, a question where I had to dig even a bit deeper into uh, the social sciences and to see um, the different um, arguments that are there. Do we need economic growth? Um, and um, and this is just uh, to show you um, um, a bit of what how, how social science uh, works. I mean, because I think you're probably not familiar with that. Um, uh, to discuss the different drivers and motives for economic growth. So I essentially did review of these um, of these topics, discussing free will. So people simply want always more until there is some sort of social coercion, um, which is uh, that we have to grow or we die. So like as, a, as an individual firm, but also as a, as a state. And um, so this is 
the way social science often works is much more, um, uh, yeah, much much less based on on models, and it's sometimes. Uh, but it's for me, it was also very interesting to to, to look into um, this kind of um, uh, science as it's completely opposed to what most physicists often do. Um, but what I think is interesting uh, to know and um, is the role of energy in materials. It came it became clear to me when I studied um, this um, that the technology that we use and that is making economic growth available to us is often strongly coupled to resource use. So which essentially mean that the work that is performed is actually performed by, by energy and, and materials, which also creates um, many social conflicts because it essentially kills, um, kills workers in the sense that it kills their jobs and, um, um, and creates a massive need for economic growth and for pushing economic growth in order to um, guarantee economic and social stability. But it's a topic that is mostly neglected by economists. So the physical um, sphere and the actual flows of matter and energy within the system uh, are not really present uh, to most economists. So this is also a topic that can be addressed by, uh, by physicists. And I think that's the reason why we have this virtuous circle of growth that um, such an increase in in uh, prosperity, but it's also vicious in the sense that we're using ever more um, material and resources that are strongly coupled to loss of biodiversity, water quality, etc. Um, so my experience, because um, I was asked to talk about a bit about um, this experience of switching um, the field, um, that it's a very that is very challenging to um, to understand. Um, a new field of study to understand economists and sociologists because they use um, terms very differently and even among each other there's much confusion of terms and much uh, um, uh, problems related to uh, people using the same words to speak of different things and speaking of the same things using different words. Um, the third thing is if you want to if you're worked in physics and you think okay i have to work i want to work something with something else your math skills and your capacities to do model building are very valuable so it's uh, uh, you may, you may find people that actually appreciate that even if you're not a specialist in in some social field um but again my repetition is work and talk with social science uh, scientists um in order to avoid being somehow trapped in your purely physics uh, perspective. Um, it's definitely worth it, although it's complicated. So thank you. If you have some questions or if you have some, if you want to discuss some ideas or you're not sure whether you uh, can take the risk of um, switching to economics or so, send me an email, I try to answer it. Um, um, yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Oliver. Um, and I want to, to also um, uh, thank both of you uh, again for your presentations. Um, now I think it, it could be interesting to develop the discussion further. And I invite uh, everyone watching us uh, here on Zoom and on YouTube uh, to uh, ask, um, to, to comment with any questions you may have. Uh, and I will bring them to our speakers, uh, the people here on Zoom, if you would wish to, to do so. Uh, I can also uh, give you um, uh, speaking rights, let's say, uh, if you want to ask the question uh, that way. Uh, but now I, I would start by um, actually asking you, um, uh, both of you, um, in fact, uh, and maybe uh, Mark can start by responding. Uh, um, so what is it like? Um, so, of course, you, you do have your own perspective uh, of how, you know, uh, economists, um, especially um, so people from the social sciences, uh, how they, uh, their perception of um, people coming from physics, um, you know, working in uh, applying uh, their models 
uh, their their math skills to economics um, and and to to um, social sciences. What is it like um, to, to be involved with uh, social scientists? Uh, what do you think is their um, course? This certainly not uh, homogenous. Uh, what is usually the, the perspective uh, from um, the, the social scientists you work with? What? Very difficult to understand you. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, something came up here. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sure. Is it better? Okay. Okay. Uh, so yeah. So basically, what is what is it like to work with social scientists, and what do you think is their general perspective of physicists being involved in socioeconomics? Is that the question for Oliver? I guess. Uh, uh, if you, if you, it's for both of you. If you could start, uh, Mark. Yeah, um, we didn't work much much with social scientists, but we are now involved in discussions, at least with economists. The um, challenge there is that the questions are different. And here to the reason they have actually joined, like on the perspective of sustainability, they have joined events. They actually go to the same two day seminar, uh, I think twice a year and talk to each other, like natural scientists, engineers, economists, and I think even psychologists, they, they really a lot of different subjects all focusing on a common theme in this case, it's sustainability aspects. Um, they go to common terms and that's very valuable, but, but also everyone notices that it's still a large distance to go um, for actually collaborating and talking the same words, like talking the same language. Yes, I can. Uh, I, I agree with Mark that it's that is very challenging, um, but I think it's the only option that you essentially have. So of course, if you want to if you want to model um, economic systems and you you have no clue about economics and and what economists how economists think, then the chances that they will read your paper and understand it and appreciate it are very, very slow, uh, low. Um, and, and I think it's, uh, it, my impression is that, that if I, that often people just give up and say, okay, I, I do my own stuff. I, I mean, in part of econophysics, I think they're very, they're, there's an excellent work in econophysics, but a part of econophysics is, is simply ignoring everything that other people have done. And then they're complaining that they are ignored too. And I think that's not very helpful um, to, to, to bring forward. Um, I think you need to try to use your, your capacities and your, your, um, your ideas and your modeling skills um, to, to apply it to something that is, um, that is interesting, that is consistent with um, the ideas of other fields, but you really have to. I, I really had to start from from zero to in in, this, in with, with some respect to um, um, to be able to discuss with economists and um, to and I went to conferences to economics conferences and in the beginning I had the idea, the impression that they simply don't understand what I was talking about and probably they weren't and um, and uh, but this this improves improved a lot i think over time um so therefore i think it's uh, it's worth it but it's it's a real challenge yeah maybe i can add we currently um have several lines of establishing collaborations let's say with traffic scientists 
And traffic science in itself is, is a multidisciplinary endeavor. So they have ecologists working there and they have psychologists and they have economists and, and everyone speaks a different language, but actually in within that faculty, they have collaborations already, of course, because they're just sitting in the same building. And now we are talking to two or three groups of them. And with one, we may actually get towards our first publication, although that's very challenging and uh, very um, a lot of work per output. But I think it's worth it because once you get to the same wording and to the same meaning and to the same questions, to address them together, you value you coming out of might be much larger than what you can do alone as a physicist. Maybe a small anecdote from my um, uh, PhD defense. Um, there was one of the professors that I was talking or I was presenting my work several times during the during my PhD. And just after the defense, he said, well, I think now I understood what you're working on or what you were actually doing and what this was for. So it, it may take years. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you for, for your answers. Um, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I was, um, I also, we also talked a bit, uh, the, 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 the moderator uh, from IAPS in, in the session with um, Dr. Magda Schiegel about this um, sort of this um, relationship uh, that starts um, being built um, and sort of strengthened as the, the years go by. Uh, with with physicists getting involved um, and and um, helping to to quantify to to establish and adapt models uh, in economics, um, so I I think it would also be interesting um, to hear your thoughts um, on how this field sort of has been developing um if we can expect that um there could be sort of um reasonable growth uh of the let's say the the amount of physicists getting involved in socioeconomics uh if we can expect uh, uh some some important breakthroughs um in a sort of medium long term um so essentially what what do you perceive um as being the the um sort of the the gains from uh this involvement uh, of physicists in in socioeconomics um for for the next few years because we, we do like we are facing um and by We sort of mean uh, humanity uh, as a whole. A lot of um, big challenges. Um, I don't know if you're hearing me correctly. Okay, maybe not. Uh, so we are facing a lot of big challenges, um, not only now with coronavirus, but but of course the uh, the, the the main concern. Uh, on the minds of, of um, a lot of people and a lot of scientists in particular, uh, climate change. Uh, so we are facing very complex problems uh, which start sort of getting, getting closer and closer um, and forcing us to uh, actually adopt more immediate um, action uh, as we get closer and not actually solve things as much as we should. Uh, so can um, the application of physics to socioeconomics sort of help us in addressing those, those big issues? Um, I think we can start with Oliver this time. Um, well, I, I mean, the, the problems of, are complex in their in, 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 nature, in their nature, <laughs> so it's a it's a it's a it's a um, complex interaction of um, of social norms, of um, economic conditions, of um, uh, rules, 
um, with with the physical environment, so with uh, ecosystems, with um, 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 uh, yeah, the laws of physics in the sense that that govern um, that govern both systems, both the, like the the, um, uh, the the ecological system, but also of course the economic system um, is is uh, somehow uh, um, bound to 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 physical laws. Um, so I think it's um, it, it is necessary that we learn again um, how to communicate um, in a in a in a sensible way and in a in a productive way um, between the natural sciences and the social sciences and in, in, in the economic sciences. Um, so, but I really think you have to you you have to think about it in this way, not where can I apply my my methods from physics to whatever problem, but um, um, so how can I communicate my work, um, with these other fields um, together? Um, that's what, what, is, what is missing and that what is uh, also um, difficult. But I think if you, um, if you try to do that, and this can be done, um, this is, then, then it, it, it can help to be, to be very, uh, to, to be very helpful for solving these problems that are not only social, not only physical, but a bit of, all, all of these. <laughs> yeah, I, actually, I actually think Oliver's work is a good example of uh, a case where it does work, but also shows that it is super hard. So you spend a lot of many years to into into research and into communication, I guess, with your colleagues. I, I think actually the, the system as a whole, like the society, but now I'm actually meaning the universities and research institutions, they are too disciplinary. They're too focused on, on uh, single subject things and publish great papers. It's actually not given that many of these challenges are running at us at a high speed. We, we don't have the time to waste to talk about only whatever career development and papers and impact factors, blah, blah. But, and, and if we, if people like Oliver, for example, goes into a different subject and gives the effort, then initially at least the number of publications and also whatever the visibility in the other field will be very low because you're coming from another field, you don't have experience, you don't know anyone. And so it's not, it's not uh, contributing to your reputation initially. It may in the long term. Oh, you have a great book. So maybe it's, it's worth it, but but it's risky to do that. And and I think that our system should support these risks because when you take the risk, some of the people will be successful and they will accelerate uh, contributing to one of some of the outstanding problems we are facing. So I think the system should soften the disciplinary boundaries and actually support actively support that not only say it I mean, everyone is saying that since decades that interdisciplinary research is great but once it comes to uh, getting a position or actually doing that actually switching field or getting a professorship or a grant more than two subjects is really not a good idea so if you have four subjects in the same that's very bad because you get four different reviewers all of them have their own ideas of how it should be and then it's not like in the discipline and yeah so it's hard i think we should take that into account i think we should foster multidisciplinary research and i think it's really not only it should i think it's necessary to address some of these big challenges like climate change Yeah, so in, in, in um, I, I think you, you brought up an important point, uh, which is also how this, you know, how physicists getting involved uh, in non-traditional uh, fields, um, how this sort of also impacts on um, studies itself. And um, I, I think we, we could address a bit um sort of the need to maybe because we this question was also asked to uh, dr Schiegel, uh and we we also asked these questions for example 
we had a session about uh, philosophy and ethics and physics. Uh, we also asked those questions if that would also uh, be important to address in, in physics degrees. Uh, so questions, um, do you think that not only should you know, these non-traditional involvements uh, be supported, uh, but also should there be um, already in a general physics degree um, in a bachelor's, for example, should um, like a, um, a sense of um, the importance of um, interdisciplinarity uh, and, for example, uh, an exposure to socioeconomics um, in specific, uh, would it be uh, important to already um, expose um, bachelor students of general physics degrees to these, these, um, these matters, these topics? Um, maybe we can start with um, Mark. I can't hear you. Sorry, I got sorry. Yeah, I, Th thank oh, you for the question. I, yeah. I didn't. I don't think we have a final, final uh, decision on that, or I don't have a final opinion myself. Because obviously, on one hand, it's important that every citizen, not only physics students, get to know that, it, that there are challenges out there which we have to solve together and we have to work together. So that should be part in this sense, in my view, of in all of the subjects, not only in physics, like make people aware of the actual societal challenges and how from their perspective and their subject, they could possibly contribute that this is a multidisciplinary endeavor and, and not only even a scientific and, and finally at the same time it's, it's also true I, I wouldn't make it um, required to to take like two courses in socio-economic physics during the bachelor's because I think that would be overkill you, you need to be shown the problems and the options and, and it's not bad to have a course, but it's not. I think it shouldn't be required in the sense that we also need physicists. We also need people who understand solid state physics very well and astrophysics very well and on all these things. And you don't, not everyone needs to specialize in, in socioeconomic physics, of course, but, but to, to put it on equal footing to say, look, there's as, astronomy and there are these particle physicists and there's solid state physics, and then there's laser physics, and then there's also this macroscopic complex system stuff where physicists can also contribute a lot. And it's underrated. Partially, I think it's our own, well, historic more or less uh, problem because many of the initial contributions of physicists are actually more or less toy models of something which physicists in their, as Oliver said, in, their way, in, in some abstract way came up with a model came up with the result and say, look what we did great to the other subject. It's not like that. It's, it's the other subject has problems and maybe you're actually helping in co-discovering them. Um, but you only bring your own view and that's part of the view, but not the full view and not the full answer. So I think this part, this is what is most important to learn already in bachelor's level because this is not, this is unlike say laser physics. If, if if you want an expert in laser physics, you educate a physicist very well in physics, and that's it. And But if you want someone in, say, medical laser applications, you need to understand at least a bit about the medical part. And that's the same with, with economic physics and, and related fields like mobility and energy systems and so on. You need to understand the other side's questions, and then the other side needs to talk to you and that's that's your task like as a physicist because you are wanting to their, to their uh, desk okay uh, thank you very much uh, mark uh, oliver any thoughts on this hmm. yeah um i i partly uh, or i mostly agree with mark that it's um it's it should I, I don't think it should be mandatory but um, I think you hardly have the opportunity to to have a look at 
um, at this sort of um, of alternative. Um, I always had uh, um, friendly professors that allowed me to essentially choose what I wanted to do. But I, I also have to admit that I was happy then to be able to go to the meeting of the German Physical Society and have a whole conference program of one week about a situation. And, um, and to see what they are doing, what I think they are doing um, wrong maybe also, or what I would do differently, but also to, to see um, how much amazing work is done there. So I think the, the, as in every field, the, the, the quality differences are simply big, but I mean, that's not different in, in economics or sociology. So I think um, that's not what I want to, uh, to say. And so it's, uh, so I think it's simply, I think most physics students don't really know um, what could be done or what they could do. And probably it's also difficult to find professors that accept um, as, as such sort of endeavor. Um, so I would appreciate if, um, if both there would be um, courses that introduce you to complex system theory and so on and also more more options to uh, to do your bachelor thesis in, in, in such a field, for example. Okay. So come to Drew Dresden. Thank you very much. Um, that could be interesting. Uh, well, I have to say that personally, this, this is a, a field that about a month ago, um, I sort of stumbled upon uh, and I'm quite interested in so. Um, I may at some point follow that advice. Um, so I, I, there's also something, um, and as I see, uh, we don't have so far questions from the audience. I do invite the people watching us. Uh, if you have any, anything on which you'd like to hear the, the thoughts of our speakers, um, do uh, start um, writing those questions now. Um, so I, I also think it would be interesting to know your thoughts because, uh, of course, economics, um, unlike the, the you know, physics in general, uh, there is sort of um, an ideological component um, that sort of also guides um, the, the work of many economists in general. Um, and I, I want to know sort of how do you navigate that um, in the sense of, does that, um, is there any ideological component to the specific economic model uh, that you try to work on, that you try to develop um to which you you try to contribute um maybe we can start with mark yeah thanks um I, I i wouldn't talk too much about economic models because we are not working ourselves on economic models but the point is that not only the economists um have ideological parts to it but also many of the socioeconomic physicists uh, including myself certainly that um, and that the the topics I work on are those p topics I care about. So energy system, for example, uh, redu reducing carbon dioxide emissions and how this can be made feasible. And you have to be very careful to distinguish your own wishes from the scientific facts, because if you have complex models, you can always invent something. Your look at. Um, but maybe they're not. And you have to really track yourself down to the facts and to the basic principles to not, to not fall for the question, oh, can I add a parameter here to make it look more impressive? Because um, the, the, given that the complex model is many parameters and many variables, typically, and the task of a physicist is to extract the few relevant ones for a particular phenomenon you're observing. And, uh, but if you're, if you're biased, like if you want 
it to be easy or hard, for example, to reduce carbon dioxide emissions? You, it, it, is it is in your brain and it influences how you, it could influence how you construct models. So it's really important that you and your colleagues around you uh, stabilize the, the process of model building, of data analysis, and of, uh, in particular, of asking the right questions. I can't talk too much about economic models, but maybe Oliver can. Yes. Uh, I can do that because one of the ideas that was behind my approach was to provide a modeling approach that is able to discuss um, different schools of economic thought. So different to physics, in economics there is a variety of, um, of schools that essentially have different assumptions and different modeling frameworks and different everything, <laughs> different moral stand on, on, on certain topics. And um, and what is, but what is interesting is that often um, these ideologies, as you as you call it, or or um, social norms, or whatever you want to, call it, as you, as you call it, want to um, are are somehow hidden in the model. So you don't really see it that it's in there, um, because it's just an implicit assumption somewhere in the thirty-eight. Um, and what I wanted to do was to provide a modeling framework that allows to study different of these schools of thought within one framework. Um, so that essentially you, you switch the parameters and you end up in a, in a, um, in a, a neoclassical or Keynesian or Marxist world um, without the need to completely switch the, um, the framework. And that's what I, what, I, what I have to say, but also about, about um, economics is that the diversity within the field I think is much bigger than what is usually seen in 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 the newspapers. So there is a huge variety of journals, of um, of uh, concepts, of um, ideas, uh, which is much broader than what is usually uh, in the political debate. Uh, so in the sense, uh, economics is not that narrow as it is often perceived by people who are not familiar with the research, which is also, I think. Um, because the teaching in economics is often quite narrow. So if you do political sciences and you have two semesters teaching of economics, or if you study physics and you do some economics, um, then the, the chance that you only get a very narrow view into the field and with the market economy is perfect and, you, you, and, and that's it, uh, is, is uh, um, not an unrealistic description of the teaching of economics. Uh, but I think in the research, it's uh, you have much more diversity and, and um, uh, yeah, which which often then doesn't get to the students, unfortunately. If, if I may, I could, I could ask a question to Oliver because I'm really interested. Yeah. You have to, is that okay? Of course. Um, you, you, I, I've seen on your homepage that you have, uh, you also mentioned that you have your new book with, I think, a course, I forgot, but, but about um, rebuilding uh, the economic system. Can you somehow summarize? what the essential, I mean, understood that you don't want to abolish market driven economy, economies, but somehow you what's the catch of, of not doing that, but doing something else? What does the other see something else aspect? Yeah, so what we essentially did was to, to, to try to get to the, um, to, to get to the ideas behind our current economic system. Um, so there are, um, of course, um, uh, also questions of uh, justice related to a market economy. Um, I, what are, what I, th I okay, like maybe I can I can explain it that way. What I because you ask how how can we rebuild the economic system? I think there are um, several things about market economies that are um, very useful and very. Um, uh, helpful also for organizing a society um, in the sense that um, there is really that it's really a decentralized system um, that has that is able to 
um, um, to, in a sense, regulate itself. What I mean by that is like that it doesn't produce like rules, but that given some political rules on how um, the exchange on market takes place, um, there is no need to have a central authority that decides how much is produced, how much is consumed. And I think that's a brilliant thing that limits the uh, power of individuals so that it's really distributing the decisions to many, many, many people, to millions of people to have a self-organized system. I think that's a brilliant thing of, of a market economy. Um, but we, of course, have several problems. Um, some are related to, um, to environment, lack of environmental limits. So um, because we leave it to the individual decisions how much to consume in the sense of uh, natural resources, um, it never will be enough. So we just, um, it's, it's so useful to use energy and more materials and to use this to produce things and to consume it to get from A to B and to um, um, that we definitely need political regulation that guarantees that we're not uh, killing our, our ecosystem. This hasn't been implemented, but it can be easily implemented in the market economy. Um, if so how, would, that, how would you do that? Well, essentially, you um, similar to um, to the, for example, the um, um, the emission trading for CO2 emissions. Um, you can also implement that for the extraction of, of uh, raw materials, and um, uh, it has already been implemented also for um, limiting um, the extraction of fish from the ocean, for example. But it's often not working well because uh, um, like the there's lots of political influence um, from those people who don't want to have this limited. Um, so I think there are questions of, of lobbying, of political power that are um, in play for the, but it's not that we don't know what we would have to do um, to actually limit um, uh, resource consumption and raw material extraction. Um, and the second, uh, the second thing is a question of justice. Um, the, the idea of a market economy is essentially one of reciprocity. So I do something and I get money back. Um, so you have, um, um, you have the idea or the ideal of, of a market economy is the exchange of equivalents. So I work and I get a, I get a decent wage and um, I buy a pizza and I have to pay a certain amount of, of money. And this is if you look at the at, at, at anthropologists, but also um, sociologists and what they have found out about perceptions of justice and fairness. Um, this is essentially something that people consider to be fair. So if you work hard, you should gain a decent, uh, a decent income. Um, and that's the idea of, or the ideal of a market economy again is um, that if you have um, if you profit from something, if you have uh, the benefit from something, you should also bear the cost. This is essentially the idea of reciprocity. Yeah? I, I, and, and if you look at um, the, both um, the ecology, where you where like the, 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 the hidden costs of emitting CO2 are around 100, 180 euros per ton, but the people that emit uh, do not pay it. This is one example where essentially this idea of reciprocity is not satisfied. Another thing is land value. So if you look at a, at a nice spot of land in London or in New York or in Munich, um, the value that is um, of this land is not created by the owner of the land, but by the, by the people around it, by the state, by other investment of people, um, by building streets and uh, and subways and uh, all other stuff. Um, so there you can also see that there's a, a huge privilege for those owning land um, that they don't have to generate the value of land themselves, but there's other people that's doing it, which is one example where again, reciprocity is not um, uh, implemented in, in, in the market economy. And essentially our book is about searching for these systematic deviations where um, uh, reciprocity or the meritocratic principle, or however you want to call it, is not satisfied, and then try to implement political um, regulations, bring the market economy closer to its ideal. Um, and uh, if this was the case, 
I'm quite sure that inequality would be much lower than it is today. Um, uh, and uh, also, the, we could um, work within the uh, carry boundaries. Um, and, but you could still profit from the features of a market economy that I think are very beneficial um, to our societies. That's the idea, essentially. We're currently preparing a, a shorter version of the, uh, so it's a, it's a book in German. So if you can't read German, then it will be difficult to follow. But we're currently preparing a, um, at least a 20 page summary in English. Uh, so that I will be ho hopefully be able to <laughs> send to you in some weeks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can, you, can you add one sentence on, on your view? Um, so we, are, we always have this problem in Germany, for example, if you stop one industry or reduce like excavation of coal, for example, yeah. then people say, oh, that's bad for the economy because yeah. and, and you lose jobs, you lose massive number of jobs. And it's actually true. Of course, you have also lost jobs in the uh, PV you, photovoltaic industry when you cancel the, the subsidies there, but still the you actually factually use uh, lose jobs and people are affected by the change. Do you have an idea of how to capture that in general? Is there any general like rule of thumb how you can smoothly get out of it? Because I, in my opinion or my observation, it's always very often the case that, that the job argument is very important and this sometimes it's true and sometimes it's thrown by the industry who is not actually caring about the jobs, they just care about the income. Um, as an argument. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right in the yeah. sense that you have to think about it. You're absolutely right in the sense that you have to think about it. In Germany, we're, I think, the idea of uh, finding uh, um, a, a way out of coal is at least 40 years old for the, for the uh, Ruhr area. And, and interestingly, we're often not caring about other sorts of jobs. So, so we're not caring about bus drivers or whatever if they're new technological uh, advancement. Um, uh, so uh, it, it seems to be, as you said, that it's uh, something that is also quite specific to, um, to the energy sector and the, the automotive sector. Um, in fact, I, I mean, in, in the lignite, um, areas and, and, and coal extraction areas, you will still have, I don't know, but 30 to 40 years to get it, to get to essentially finish the job there and to turn it back into a, 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 an, an environment and to build like as they did around Leipzig to build some lakes, etc. So it's not that there is not uh, work to be done. I think there is a problem that um, with um, the, the that the, those people working there actually want to keep their jobs. But I think you have to find ways to tell them, okay, um, we, uh, we have some technological change now. We also have facing um, big environmental challenges and you, you really have to try to find new jobs that, that they can do. And I think there is still um, a lot to be done. It's not that you can close down the coal, um, the, the extraction site, and then you leave it there as it is. So, um, and, but of course, I mean, this is, I think this is the most important argument that is always uh, put forward. Um, and, uh, and of course, it's something you have to care about. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, apologies about um, briefly my connection fell. Um, thank you for, to, to Mark for asking his question to Oliver. Um, I think these were very interesting points uh, and especially to hear about your um, the research that you conducted for the book. Um, so now I just um, ask you um, if you have any sort of additional or final message, because I see that uh, um, unfortunately it seems our viewers have not placed any questions, uh, but I would like to, to give you um, sort of a few minutes um, to, to elaborate uh, on any final thoughts. Uh, I think we 
we went through extremely important points here uh, from the, the relationship um, of, of physicists uh, with um, social sciences, um, from the more educational perspective as well, um, and uh, um, a few details um, about your, your work. Uh, so maybe um, if you could, um, uh, if you want to sort of leave us here, uh, any final general thoughts about the topic or any message for any students considering that field, um, for example, uh, what they, um, what sort of research they could um, already engage in, um, what, what organizations they could follow um, in terms of their work. Um, so essentially, um, that is, um, that is what, what I ask. And maybe we can start with Oliver. Okay, yeah, I mean, I, some, some recommendations for those people who are still interested in working um, in, this, uh, in this direction. Um, if you, if, I mean, my, um, my experience was that I, I couldn't really find my, my way into physics and to, to find something where I was uh, really deeply interested in, um, in the field of, I don't know, accelerator physics or, or solid state physics. Um, be aware of the fact that you can contribute to, to these social or environmental problems or that you can, uh, you, that there is this field um, and it's and that I hope and think that it will gain an importance in the future because it's one of the, the approaches to really bring together um, people from different fields if you do it properly. So really try to do it and be aware of the fact that it's difficult and hard and sometimes frustrating because you think, okay, because people simply think differently than you do. But it's very worse to do it because you learn a lot about the world, you learn a lot about how other fields and people think, um, which is also useful for um, uh, just because, I mean, we're, we're useful, it's very interesting, I think. Um, um, and, and see if you can, I think, for example, for the, um, in, in the German, in the German physical society, in this network, there are also people from not only from Germany. So see if you can find some, some people that support you doing this. Um, I always was able to find some professors that was uh, giving me the freedom to work on what I wanted. And it's worth trying to find the things you are interested in and, uh, and continue searching for it if you think you haven't found it. Uh, uh, I think it's the essence of what uh, a good life and also good life as a researcher uh, can be. So that's what I really want to motivate you. And again, if you have any questions and want to send me an email, uh, simply do it. I really hope that I can answer and don't forget it. If not, write me a second email. Um, uh, so try to find some people that support you. Yeah, thanks. I, I can only add very briefly what I think the it's as Oliver said, it's it's super hard, but it's super rewarding as well. And I think what's most important, it's fun and it's cool because very some of the problems, although they are big, a piece of the problem you can very often, after some effort, solve in a in a nice way. It's it's like real physics. You you for example, we we condensed a traffic problem which which acts on a high dimensional complex street network onto a, a two unit more or less spin system and and that that system you can solve it's super nice and then you can generalize again that's what we do all the time and yeah it's it's fun if you want to join join uh, for example the german physical society it's it's like 20 some euros a year and of course, join socioeconomic physics in that society. Very happy to, to have you in. And uh, last but not least, you have one life. We have a lot of challenges as a society. You have lots of interesting opportunities to do research on. And, and make sure you spend your, your time for what you like, your 
time to be spent. So if you think it's worth working on climate change or change the economy or working on mobility or changing the energy system or making uh, society more just, try to find your project. It might take a while until you have it and then it's super fascinating. Just join us. Uh, ask anyone in this SOE section, uh, ask people in my group. They're all having lots of fun and they're also having lots of trouble, of course. They fight and then they get it. But it's the same in every subject. If you if you want to find Higgs boson, you, you have the same problem. You fight for years and at some point you get it or not. Still it's fun. Okay, uh, thank you very much for those final messages. Uh, so I want to thank everybody uh, who has been watching us. Um, my apologies for all of the technical issues as well um, to everyone watching and to our speakers. Uh, and I also want to uh, thank um, both uh, Mark and Oliver for being present uh, and for being available for this session. Uh, thank you very much for this um, outlook um, and this overview of um, socioeconomic physics. Um, I definitely think it is very interesting uh, to at least explore this, this field for students to at least uh, think about uh, the, the potential um, of the applications of physics to, to or, or the, the contributions of, uh, of physics to socioeconomics. Um, and uh, just remind our audience that uh, we will have, have um, a, a, another session today and we will continue up set a distance. Uh, so thank you everybody again and have a nice day.